Welcome to Aging Insights. I'm Melissa Chalker, Deputy Director of the New Jersey Foundation for Aging. The Foundation's mission is to enable seniors to live with independence and dignity in their communities. Aging Insights is produced by the New Jersey Foundation for Aging to provide information and resources to boomers, seniors, and caregivers. The primary focus being to share important information and connect people to community-based programs. You may not have heard about them, but New Jersey's Office of the Ombudsman for the Institutionalized Elderly provides some very important services. Here to talk to us today about the programs and services are New Jersey's Ombudsman, Jim Kraken, and Volunteer Advocate Coordinator, Janet Conlian. Thank you both for joining me today. I'm really excited to have you here to talk um, about the uh, Ombudsman's Office as well as some particular programs that you provide there. Jim, if you could just start off reminding our audience, because people might not know what the Ombudsman's Office is, and you know that title, the uh, New Jersey Office of the Ombudsman for the Institutionalized Elderly, that's a lot of words. What exactly does that mean, and, and why does the office exist? Well, thank you very much for having <laughs> us on the show and we appreciate the opportunity to get out and mm -hmm. have, be able to talk to the public mm -hmm. about the vital services uh, we provide uh, vulnerable seniors living in licensed long-term care communities. Mm -hmm. We're part of a national resident focused advocacy group mm -hmm. that seeks to provide the health, safety, welfare, civil and human rights of people who are 60 years and older who live in um, licensed long-term care settings mm -hmm. and we work to bring about systems change on local, state and federal levels. Um, for mm -hmm. those for that population. Mm -hmm. So just so people understand at home when we say institutionalized or when you say licensed long-term care settings you're talking about nursing homes and assisted livings is that Yeah that's general? correct. The easy way to remember it mm -hmm. is I, I try to when, when I ask people uh, when people ask me that question is I would say if it's licensed regulated or funded by any sort of government agency mm -hmm. it's probably our jurisdiction mm -hmm. um, but if it's not and you contact our office we'll certainly get you to the appropriate agency where you can be mm -hmm. provided help and, and uh, services. Mm -hmm. But generally, uh, we're nursing homes, mm -hmm. assisted living, mm -hmm. uh, boarding homes, mm -hmm. residential health care um, communities, uh, continuing care retirement communities, right. and uh, the two non-residential areas we have are adult medical and social daycare centers. Okay, so in addition to um, residential settings also where people are going for like a medical day care type of yeah. setting you also would oversee those facilities we don't oversee those facilities but, but we advocate on behalf of those right. who are, are getting services yeah. from those providers that's a good distinction so let's tell people that that your office is responsible for um, advocating for the people that are in those facilities not for the overall ratings or anything else of those facilities correct absolutely mm -hmm. correct but if in the course of our advocacy mm -hmm. in solving a person's problems mm -hmm. Um, we suspect there's criminal activity or um, regulatory violations. Mm -hmm. With the resident's consent, we will, refer, we will uh, refer to the appropriate agency. For that. So, and just so people understand, um, could you give us an example of a reason why someone might call your office or, or what it is that, or, and after they call, how would you intervene to, to help in that situation? Sure. The Older Americans Act is, um, requires that every state in U.S. territory must mm -hmm. have a long-term care ombudsman mm -hmm. to advocate on behalf of residents. Here in New Jersey, we're a little unique in that we are the state agency that gets uh, complaints mm -hmm. um, of abuse, neglect, and exploitation from mandatory reporters. Mm -hmm. So anybody through the course of their employment who has a reasonable suspicion that a resident of that long-term care community mm -hmm. is being abused, neglected, or exploited by anyone, it can even be resident to resident, mm -hmm. must report that to our office. Mm -hmm. Now, all long-term care providers do have a system uh, internally for dealing with these cases, right. and typically um, we get a mandatory report from the provider itself, mm -hmm. um, but the individual who works there certainly can um, and, and in many circumstances does mm -hmm. report to our office. We do get complaints from another, a number of other individuals as well. We get complaints from residents themselves. Mm -hmm. um, we get complaints from friends, from relatives, mm -hmm. obviously family members mm -hmm. being very common, whatnot. Uh, and we even get anonymous complaints. And right. with the anonymous complaint, um, we, will, we will open cases because we realize some people are just mm -hmm. uh, very concerned about a situation but concerned about any repercussions it may have in them. Oh, sure. And even when a person does not file an anonymous complaint, it's important to know that we keep the identity of the complainant confidential. Right. So you're not going to walk into a facility and say we're here because so and so called and then we're going to now investigate this, right? Absolutely not. You, right. That you is, just come in and say <clears throat> what your 
there for. If if we even say that, yeah, right? We, we might, you know, based on the type of complaint, mm -hmm. we may come in and we may interview several residents, mm -hmm. so that particular resident can't be identified who the right. complaint was about. Mm -hmm. um, we may do some chart reviews. We may talk to staff. We may talk to volunteers mm -hmm. uh, in the building, whatever, uh, mm -hmm. and certainly, um, you know, the resident themselves, because mm -hmm. we have to get the consent. Right. Um, so. Uh, we it, make every attempt to try to keep mm -hmm. um, things as confidential sure. as possible. And but the complainant would never be identified. Mm -hmm. And um, can you um, maybe give us an example of what a complaint would be, what, what a valid complaint is for someone to call and report? Sure. Unfortunately, many of the cases we get are, are very disturbing mm -hmm. um, and concerning. Mm -hmm. um, but we do get a lot of cases, uh, complaints of financial exploitation. Mm -hmm. Uh, the typical offender there is a family member, mm -hmm. typically a son or daughter. Mm -hmm. We get a lot of complaints regarding transfer, involuntary transfer and discharge issues okay. uh, where a resident is um, potentially being transferred or discharged from a long-term care provider uh, and that is not driven by them. Mm -hmm. uh, but unfortunately, the largest um, category of cases that we get is, is abuse. Mm -hmm. And abuse can be um, verbal, mm -hmm. can be physical, mm -hmm. uh, can be assault, mm -hmm. can be sexual abuse, can be confinement, mm -hmm. uh, could be neglect. Neglect we define as a professional's a failure to follow their standards of care. Mm -hmm. um, and that's unfortunately the largest number the of largest cases number of we get. So uh, if someone um, has a loved one in a facility and they feel like any of those things are happening to that individual, they can call your office. They can call our office, mm -hmm. they can fax us, or they can email us. Mm -hmm. And then someone, as you said before, comes out to the facility and investigates whether that be interviewing other residents, including the resident who's been identified in the complaint, as well as reviewing medical records and staff interviews, I'm assuming, and that sort of thing? Yes. I have... Uh staff who have um, law enforcement backgrounds mm -hmm. as well as registered nurses. Mm -hmm. So based on the nature of the complaint, we'll be assigned to one mm -hmm. of those um, individuals mm -hmm. and uh, they will come out and investigate the complaint, get the consent of the resident, mm -hmm. uh, make sure that uh, we resolve it to, to their satisfaction. Mm -hmm. And again, we work with local law enforcement, uh, the attorney general's office, county prosecutors mm -hmm. uh, and any state agency or federal government agency mm -hmm. uh, that has uh, regulatory jurisdiction sure. as well. And I'm sure depending on the complaint, the, the uh, investigation and the resolution or, or intervention, it looks different, you know, depending on the, the case too, right? I mean, not every case has the same intervention, right? You're going to have different, if it's abuse, yeah. it's going to be about getting the abuser out, out of the picture or, you know, yeah. if it's neglect, it's about reprimanding that facility so that the, these things, things don't happen again. Is that? We open over 3,000 cases a year and they're all unique. Yeah, yeah. It's unfortunate that it's that many, but it's yeah. good that there is a, an office there to, to look after folks. So I think that's a great um, example for everyone uh, watching as to what the role of your office is uh, in our state. Um, but we're here um, today to kind of highlight a specific program uh, under your um, office, which is the Volunteer Advocate Program. Yeah. Can you maybe explain to people what that is and how that fits into to what your office yeah, does? Yeah, absolutely. It's a, it's a program that I am extremely proud of mm -hmm. uh, and that we have focused on since I have been in office um, been appointed to this office mm -hmm. by the governor in, in 2010. Uh, when I came into the office in 2010, we had less than 140 volunteers. We're happy to have over mm -hmm. 270 now. Mm -hmm. um, and because our, uh, our, our paid staff, so to speak, um, you know, is busy really investigating mm -hmm. a lot of cases of abuse, neglect, and exploitation complaints that we get into mm -hmm. our office, um, the volunteers, although they assist in those um, matters mm -hmm. uh, in, in virtually all cases, mm -hmm. um, but they're the ones who are um, doing the day-to-day -day advocacy for vulnerable seniors who live in licensed long-term care communities, primarily nursing homes with the Volunteer Advocate Program. Mm -hmm. um, and they're, de they're developing the relationships and they are um, someone that um, the residents can confide with uh, to talk about issues, to talk about concerns, mm -hmm. 
to talk about complaints, uh, to talk about joys too. Mm -hmm. um, and many people uh, who live in licensed long-term care settings um, don't have family in the area or any family or mm -hmm. a at all who is advocating on their behalf. Mm -hmm. um, so the volunteer advocate in many circumstances fulfills that role and they do a fantastic job. Sure, so um, while you know your office is there and receives complaints or calls um, about concerns at facilities, the volunteer advocates are more kind of like the eyes and ears. They're going out into the, into the facilities and checking up on how things are going and communicating with the residents. Is That's that a, a good true. explanation? Yes. Okay. Um, and so uh, Janet is here to give us a little bit more detail about the program, but uh, I have to say that I really enjoy hearing how proud you are of this program and, and what uh, and what the role is of those. So I'm really glad that you're both here today to share it with yeah. and Thank Janet you. is here My to pleasure. give us some of the, the, the details of the Volunteer Advocate Program. So as Jim said, and, and I kind of tried to recap of um, the Volunteer Advocates being really the eyes and ears of the Ombudsman's Office. And so if you could just to explain um, to us um, who the volunteer advocates are, how your office finds them, uh, you know, okay. that sort well, of thing. Uh, some good questions. Yes. Um, <laughs> there's no quintessential volunteer advocate. Mm -hmm. Our advocates come from all walks of life, mm -hmm. um, all different backgrounds, um, and all ages. Our, our youngest advocate now is 26, and our oldest is going to be 92. <laughs> well, um, that's and a pretty wide range. We have a wide range. Mm -hmm. um, they're recruited in a variety of ways. We do have an outreach coordinator that is very active. Um, mm -hmm. And sometimes you might even walk into a diner and see a placemat that has call, mm -hmm. gives our number, et cetera. Mm -hmm. We also, um, Jim participates in shows like this. Mm -hmm. We have letters to the editor. Um, the, some really popular um, method of, of, av of recruiting volunteers has been these little senior magazines. Mm -hmm. um, get a lot of calls through those. And mm -hmm. then, you know, we, as all of our coordinators, are four people that pretty much do what I do, also get a lot of referrals from other mm -hmm. people. Sure. So the advocate position itself was, you know, very well explained by Jim. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, I think we're the proactive piece of this organization. Sure. Because the advocate is assigned to usually just one facility. Mm -hmm. That facility becomes their facility, so to speak. And their consistent presence allows for the resident to gain some trust, which Jim already talked about. Mm -hmm. And to, after a while, they're waiting for the, re for the advocate to come in the door. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's so how often would a volunteer advocate v visit the facility that they're assigned to? Good question. We ask them to go at least once a week. Mm -hmm. Um, give four hours a week to the program, mm -hmm. and um, some people go two or three times a week. Some people go um, for m many more hours than the mm -hmm. four hours. They, as Jim said earlier, their goal is to build relationships mm -hmm. and walking around, talking to the residents, mm -hmm. uh, finding out what their concerns are. Um, and when they give us permission, then the advocate can advocate for them. Mm -hmm. uh, we do need to get permission. Right. They're adults. Mm -hmm. They're not children. Right. That's a very good distinction to make, that while they're there to advocate on behalf of these individuals, they can't just come in and do whatever they want. They have to get Correct. permission to, to report anything or to, to advocate on behalf of that individual. Yes. Yeah. They have to respect the confidentiality mm -hmm. of the resident. Sure. And so their um, requirement in terms of reporting back to your office, um, because they have to go there weekly, are they giving you some type of standard report or just when there's an issue? Um, Another good question. Um, <laughs> I've got a lot of them. Yeah, and, and they're all good. Um, we ask them to do a couple of things while they're they have to. Mm -hmm. They should be taking notes, number right. one, um, and then they should be checking out with um, a staff member. Many times it's the administrator mm -hmm. uh, or the director of nursing, and mm -hmm. then they do a weekly report. Mm -hmm. And the weekly report will sometimes be given at that time to the administrator, depending upon what, um, how complex it is, mm -hmm. or be given to that person maybe a couple of days later. Mm -hmm. But there's a reporting piece, mm -hmm. and that's an, that's an important piece. Otherwise, you just essentially have someone walking around the facility, mm -hmm. which is not what we want. We right. want someone there to mm -hmm. um, resolve issues. Sure, and as you said, build a relationship, and you know that's a very important piece of the it program. Is all about, and Jim it's said. the difference of using the volunteer advocates versus using a staff person. Um, to do that sort of role. So I, I kind of jumped right into what they do when they get to the facility, um, but we skipped right from recruiting to that. So uh, well, in between there, there's training that happens, Yes, right? there's training. Uh, and, 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 so. and I also have to say that the recruitment process is quite involved. Yeah. Um, it, it's uh, normally we get a contact from the potential advocate. They fill out an 
application. There's a telephone screening. Mm -hmm. After the telephone screening, then there's a one-on-one -on -one interview, mm -hmm. um, reference check, criminal background check, and then mm -hmm. they get to come to training. Right. So this isn't I call your office and say I want to be a volunteer advocate and I'm in a facility the next day. There's a process yeah. here the, yes. of screening to make sure that they're appropriate for the position, for the role of, of being a volunteer advocate. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Many people want to, they think they want to do this, they're excited mm -hmm. about it, mm -hmm. but honestly when they hear about the logistics they're thinking, you know, I, I want to be more of a friendly visitor. Mm -hmm. And maybe right. it's not for me. Maybe it's not. Yeah. 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 So that's great that there's a right. process of, I'm sure, on the telephone interview or the screening oh, yes. that you're explaining to right. them what their responsibility is so that they can figure out if it's a fit for them as well as you figuring out if, if it's a it's fit a, for you. It, absolutely. <laughs> and we do it delicately. I, yes. <laughs> well, um, you have to. Yeah. We talked about there not being, um, you know, a, a picture perfect uh, person in terms right. of age or anything, but they also don't need to have any. Um, prerequisites like a certain degree or a back no. career background it can be no they have to be 21 mm -hmm. um, the, the major criteria is that they want to help this vulnerable population mm -hmm. and they have a passion for it and they're willing to put the work into it mm -hmm. And so once they've been screened and approved, they, then enough. they go through the training process. Can you describe to us what yes. the training process is like? Um, our training process is actually a certification program. Okay. Um, when I started this, about the same time Jim started, mm -hmm. um, there was a wonderful training manual. There mm -hmm. was a pretty good model, but things changed. The, the program had to evolve. So right now what we have is a pretty um, updated program which is, focuses on everything from uh, residence rights to ethics mm -hmm. to how to handle complaints. The program is four full days. It's very interactive. Mm -hmm. The material is delivered by people who are content experts such as Jim McCracken, mm -hmm. um, our general counsel, mm -hmm. nurse investigators, mm -hmm. Um, and at the end of the day, people walk out, and the goal is for them to walk out with a new lens. Mm -hmm. If they were lawyers, we don't want them looking at the facility as a lawyer. Right. If they were doctors, mm -hmm. we also don't want that. We want them to look at it uh, through a lens of an advocate. Mm -hmm. And if we've done that, then we've done a good job. Right. So the training, um, as you said, is four days. Yes. And it's, it's four days of you know, really comprehensive things yes. because you're teaching them, as you say, to be an advocate, but probably also about how the nursing home business operates and, and maybe giving them some regulatory guidelines on which to conduct themselves. There's right? a whole unit on the long-term care environment. Mm -hmm. and, um, and and also in that in those cases, we do bring in the, the right staff to, to teach these units. Mm -hmm. So they're getting the information from the content experts. Many people have some experience in long-term care, but most don't. So, yeah, you're right, they need to be immersed. Yeah, and so they're yeah. probably learning a little bit about long-term care settings, a little bit about gerontology and maybe, you know, Normal. learning about older adults and that sort of thing. So it's a really comprehensive training. Eleven you know? modules. Yeah, wow. Yeah, eleven <laughs> modules over four days, and then they're given a certification exam, um, oh. which is they're ready for. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, after that, once mm -hmm. it's all been achieved, we have them shadow. So. Okay, so they go through the four-day training. Yes. Then they take an exam. Yes. And is, uh, that, I'm, I'm amazed at this exam process. Right. So at, I'm assuming at the end of the fourth day they take the exam, or is it yes, a complete they do. separate? Okay. Yeah, at the end of the fourth uh, day. And is it you know multiple choice? Is it oh like, come on! <laughs> you're all, yes, it's 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 actually a, a lot of different. It's a mm -hmm. good instrument. Okay. You know good. to measure their achievements. Mm -hmm. Right. It it is multiple choice. Mm -hmm. It's fill-ins. Mm -hmm. It's uh, short-term answers. Mm -hmm. It's it's uh, it's comprehensive. Sure. We don't want people who are watching this program to be discouraged. Yeah, right. I'm not exactly. trying to discourage yeah. anyone yeah. from, from yes, don't be afraid of the test. Yeah. Because of the exam. Don't You're be right. afraid and of the everyone test. Everyone is well prepared. For Everyone's it. well prepared, <laughs> and uh, we, we have never lost one yet. Okay. <laughs> well, that's good. That's what I was going to ask. That. No, I, I, <laughs> the no. success rate. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it is um, mm -hmm. it's a terrific program. Uh, we've had so much input from mm -hmm. the people who know what they're doing in the field. Mm -hmm. We use um, music, we use videos, we use mm -hmm. instruments um, in, uh, to identify mm -hmm. you know, where they're at with, with certain pieces of, of the material. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, people will say, I didn't expect this. Mm -hmm. we, we received something much more than we thought we were going to get, mm -hmm. and we really, really are, they'll say, blown away by it in a positive way. Well, that's fantastic. Yeah. I mean, you want people who are going to be advocating on behalf of older adults right. living in facilities to, to have an understanding of, of what their role is and of, and of what 
someone sh how someone should be treated in those environments. And so I think a training that comprehensive um, is really amazing to put people through that. Uh, and so after their exam, um, then as you were starting to say, they, they shadow someone who's currently... They will shadow probably um, at least two people, mm -hmm. two, or two to four times. Mm -hmm. And the person that they shadow will fill out a, a form mm -hmm. which evaluates the sure. potential advocate yeah. and share it with the regional coordinator. Mm -hmm. And then, if it all goes like we'd like it to, the person will be placed in one facility. Mm -hmm. And that's a process as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, finding the right facility, I'm sure, because if people call and they live in a certain area, they might want to, you know, be assigned to a facility that's within a, a you know... Geography. Yeah, in, within their area, not somewhere they're going to have to drive really far to get to or... Right. Yes, yeah. exactly the mm -hmm. case. So we do try to place them close to home. Mm -hmm. Uh, sometimes it's it's not possible, or sometimes if someone speaks a, a particular language, a second oh. language, um, we have certain units, as Jim will say, within mm -hmm. the state that are um, comprised of mostly one particular group, whether mm -hmm. they speak Russian or mm -hmm. uh, Chinese or whatever, so mm -hmm. I will try to get that person to go to that facility. Sure, and I know my know colleagues would do need. the same thing. Sure, if yeah. there's a need, um, yes. obviously, for a right. bilingual individual who can communicate yes. to you know, residents who have uh, speak another language, and that obviously would be a good fit for them, regardless of the geography, I guess. Yes, we will try to lure them there. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and so this this is a really interesting because again, you know, I, you know, I want people to understand that this isn't. I call up and say I want to be a volunteer advocate, and you're boom, you're there. This is a process which is wonderful um, for the training and the exam and the evaluation uh, and then they're assigned to the facility. Uh, and so we started to talk about when they get to the facility and how they operate and what their role is there um, and building relationships with residents. But I assume they should also alert staff that of their role. They should introduce themselves to somebody. There's a formal placement mm -hmm. process mm -hmm. where my colleagues and I will uh, set up an appointment with the administrator, mm -hmm. bring the um, potent the advocate mm -hmm. to this meeting and introduce them to all the department heads mm -hmm. Um, let them you know, get a sense of, mm -hmm. of, of how the facility operates. Right. So I want people to know that they're, they're not a secret shopper. They're not going to tiptoe <laughs> in and, and, and blend into the right. thing. No. This is a formal process where they're introduced, as you said, to, to the um, management of the building and the, the leadership so that people know who they are and what their role is while they're visiting, right? Yes, and um, while they're there, they're going to be asking questions mm -hmm. you know, of the staff, so they mm -hmm. need to know who the staff Sure. Are and what their roles are, mm -hmm. and the staff needs to get comfortable with the advocate too. Sure, absolutely, because I think um, it's important, as Jim, you know, mentioned the relationship building. I think it's not just about relationship building with the residents, but also with the staff, so that they understand the role of the person coming in too. Because, uh, you know, obviously doing their job, they you know might feel awkward about someone coming in and evaluating them or, or asking questions. But if they're acquainted with the role and why the volunteer advocate is there, then it might make that a little easier. Yes, and you're segueing into something very important mm -hmm. that Jim also mentioned. We are resident driven. Right. And we train the advocates mm -hmm. to speak to the residents mm -hmm. and not observe employees. Right. Mm -hmm. The focus is mm -hmm. the resident, what are the resident's needs, what mm -hmm. does the resident um, want that he maybe or she isn't getting. Mm -hmm. And we may be, our advocates might be the only person that it visits that resident that doesn't have, I don't want to say their own agenda, but has only the resident's needs in mind. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And someone who's somewhat objective because, Thank you know, you. if I'm going to a facility to visit right. uh, my mother or my aunt or somebody, you know, I'm going to be like, oh, well, if she's, why isn't she getting this and why That's isn't she right. getting that? Whereas someone who's been trained as a volunteer advocate is really more objective and, and looking at it from a different lens of yeah, rather from what than the resident the, yeah. wants. Mm -hmm. Sure. I'm sure Jim will attest to there are times when a family member wants something, but the <laughs> resident doesn't. <laughs> doesn't that, right. You know, Those and, always so, create yeah. challenging that's so situations. True. Right. It's so true. So, um, mm -hmm. so that's why we try to try to assuage the, you know, the, not I wouldn't say fears, but mm -hmm. the feelings of the nursing nursing home staff mm -hmm. and saying we're here for the resident. We're not here to observe the employees. Right. Um, and that I think is, that's that's a good way to introduce the advocate. Yeah. I, again, I think this is uh, a terrific um, program because, as you said, it is resident-driven, and this, in, in t on top of all the other things that your office does, the idea that there's someone there who's just focused on um, on making sure the residents get what they want or Correct. what they need is, is terrific. So if someone has heard all this and they want to be a volunteer advocate, they should call the office or visit your website. Is there any information on the website that they yes. could go and read and learn yes, more? Yes, they should get on our website. Uh -huh. and, Great. and we'll, um, we'll give that information out on the screen that's so that they can um, you yes. know, make a phone call so they not only know where to call if they have a, a concern, but where to call if they want to help.
absolutely right, and want to be part of the of the project right. so uh, I really think it's a, a terrific um, program and I really appreciate you both taking time I know you're incredibly busy um, working on all of these important issues <laughs> so I appreciate you taking the time to join me today to explain to um, the audience what exactly your office does and, uh, and about the volunteer advocate program and I hope you get some calls I hope people are uh, intrigued and interested and want to join um, the effort and what you're doing so well, we certainly respect the work that the New Jersey Foundation on Aging does and we appreciate the opportunity to come in, come here today and talk to you so well, thank you thank, thank you. you so much thank you both very much uh, and thank you for sharing your time with us today as well uh, again aging insights is produced by the New Jersey Foundation for aging and it is made possible by donations to the foundation to become a sponsor for Aging Insights programs, please go to our website at www.njfoundationforaging.org or call us in the office at 609-421-0206. All of our previous shows can be viewed on the website. We want to remind you to find out about senior services in your area. You can contact your county office on aging. Their numbers are also on our website or you can call the state hotline at 1-877-222-3737. Thank you for watching this episode of Aging Insights, and remember, aging is everyone's business.